They die for his mum. <laughs> nah, it's good. You know, what do you do? Um, what does a pastor do? What does actually a pastor do? This is a question I asked myself about five or six years ago. But I started out in ministry, and it was really obvious what I should do. Uh, and it was obvious to the church I was in and what I should be involving myself in. But what does a pastor actually do? And I want to put up a meme that I found during the week. Uh, this guy says, this is a pastor, obviously, I thought my sermon would be good. It was just okay. I thought my other sermon was average and revival broke out. I have no idea what I'm doing. And sometimes it can actually feel that way. It's like you prepared something, you slave over it, and you think it's going to be amazing. And then, well, it doesn't bomb. It never bombs. There's always good sermon pastor on the way out of the door. It doesn't bomb, but you know when it's really hit and you know when people are really affected. And sometimes you just got no idea what's going to land and what's not going to land. A bit like, I suppose, if you some people, musicians say, I wrote a hit song and I didn't know it was going to be a hit song. Right? Sometimes it's like that. You don't know exactly what you're doing. It's like that Bible verse which says, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. You've still got to labor. You've still got to do the work. But it's God that does that extra little bit. It was at the end of, it was, five, it was actually five years ago where the church that I was part of previously, we'd got to a certain stage and I was really, like I felt like we'd done what God wanted us to do. And I was actually, I wasn't depressed, but I was just pushing into that sense of what is it next, God? What do I need to do next? And I was sort of asking myself, what actually does a pastor do? Some of you, some of you might ask yourself that same question. What does a pastor do? And God spoke to me really clearly through a scripture. Have you ever been reading the Bible and you've come upon a piece of scripture that maybe you have read before and maybe you're even familiar with, but it's like somehow God just like illuminates the Bible to you and you're really struck with it? Have you ever had that experience where God just shines his light? And part of me when God showed me this, I'm like, I should have known that before. It's like this is really sort of obvious, this is what a pastor is actually meant to do in a church. But I had to humble myself and then refocus my energy again on what it was that God was actually saying to me. And it, come, it came from Ephesians chapter 4, and a lot of you will know this scripture, and it will be familiar to you. But I, I want to share it with you as we start this new series, because it really struck me about what goes on in the life of church and the different roles that we all play, that you play, that I play, that people play in the life of our church. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to kick off this series where we're looking at Matthew 4, the whole of Matthew 4, over the next couple of months. There's a couple of little guest speakers here and there and other things, but Pastor Lauren and myself mostly are going to exegete Matthew 4. But as we, and even before we do that, I just want to give this as a framework of understanding of how we're going to approach Matthew 4. But in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, starting at verse 11, it says this, Now these are the gifts God gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Let's just stop there just for a minute because I want to talk about what that means. The gifts that he's talking about here are not only the apostles, the prophets and the pastors and teachers because he makes it clear in his other letters that every one of you, and I use that word, every one of you, if you are a believer, if you have the Holy Spirit within you, when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes with gifts. And even later on, 1 Corinthians tells us we can pursue spiritual gifts. So don't think you're stuck with only the ones that you receive when you became a Christian. You can actually pursue other spiritual gifts as well. But like the important thing in that for me is this. You all have been given supernatural spiritual abilities which go beyond what you might normally be able to do if you did not have the Holy Spirit within you. You have supernatural abilities which are given to the church as a gift. So God wraps it up, sticks it under the Christmas tree, and said, here is a gift for the church. Now, God, I believe, gives the church 
the gifts that it needs for the season that it's in, and we want to use those gifts. Imagine you get a gift card, you stick it in a drawer, and you don't look at it for 12 months, and then it expires. It's a waste of a gift. Imagine if God, and I want you to hear the word you, imagine if God has given you as a gift to this church, and what he's been what he's given to you to use in this church, we don't use. It's like a guitar that's meant to have six strings that's only got five, a motor that's meant to have eight cylinders that's only got seven, whatever analogy you want to use that helps you understand. When we're all singing and playing in the same choir, it's a beautiful sound, but when something is missing, it's not what it could be. So that, that's not to make you feel like, I sometimes feel, sometimes people feel guilty about what I'm saying. Don't feel guilty about that. Feel really encouraged that you are a gift to this church. And we want to help you find what it is that God has gifted you in so you can serve him here in this place. He does mention in this particular passage um, the apostles, people that, you know, see bigger picture stuff and, and, and work in an apostolic way. The prophets, people who speak truth now and into the future. Evangelists, people who lead people to Jesus. We should all be witnesses. We should all share our faith. But there are some people that are, that are supernaturally enabled to be able to really lead people to Christ. And pastors and teachers, that designation, pastor and teacher, that and, that actually draws those two words together, pastor and teacher. And this is where the verse and the scripture really spoke to me really clearly. It's what God highlighted to me about what am I meant to be doing? What, what, do, I, what do I actually do? Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Verse 13, I'll continue on. This will continue on until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. It's like one thing I say often at ministry team meetings is Sunday comes every week. And that's like sort of an obvious statement, but it's true. The, the weeks roll on. It's like Sunday and ministering to people. It comes every week. It never stops. Ministry is like never ending. Now, why is ministry never ending? Because people, we want people to become more like Jesus. We want people to say yes to Jesus at every point in their life. And that doesn't stop until the Bible tells us we see him face to face and then we will be like him. So perfection, this side of heaven, it doesn't, it doesn't happen, but that's what we're, that's what we're working, working towards. God, Philippians 1, God who has begun a good work in you, will continue that work until the day of salvation. So that's, that's what we're trying to say. That's what I'm trying to say, sum it up, before we jump into Matthew 4. You are all, you are all ministers. You're all ministers. You're all here to do ministry. What does that look like for you? Have you discovered what it is God wants you to do? Don't feel guilty. Feel excited about that. Feel like you've actually got something to contribute. Sometimes, you know, it's distressing how little people think of themselves sometimes. And it's distressing the words that have been spoken. And I wonder if you feel like this is a message for someone else because it couldn't possibly be you that God actually is thinking of in this moment. I don't want you to think that. I want you to understand you're a gift to this church. That is a responsibility. It should spur you on. But hear me saying it to you in a super encouraging way. What is it God could do through you? The last couple of months, we've, if you've been around, we've been looking at uh, the spiritual uh, practices. And particularly we've been honing, on, honing in on the fact that Jesus himself in his humanity, was developing and growing as a person. That's a, I mean, that's a theological, wow, how do we deal with that type question? How does Jesus grow uh, as a, in his humanity to become more like God, to become obedient to God? Because he is God, and we don't want to ever lose that. But nonetheless, 
we've seen his development. And one of the key places we saw um, a, couple, a few, couple of times is at his baptism, where at his baptism, he heard this voice from heaven, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. After that baptism came his time of temptation and his time of testing. In Matthew chapter 4, we're going to look at just the first four verses this week, and I'm going to, I'm going to read, them, read them to you now. Matthew chapter 4. After Jesus has understood who he is, now he's going to be led into the desert for a time of temptation. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the Scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This time in the desert, just follow the schedule. He understands who he is. I am the Son of God. Perhaps he only fully understood that at his baptism when he heard that voice from heaven. It affirms to him who he is. Now, similar when you have said yes to Jesus for the very first time. When you understand yourself that you are a Christian. You're a daughter and a son of the King. For some of you, you've been baptized as well to symbolize that. And baptism is an incredible way, not only of obedience, but also to say, I am a believer. I am a Christian. I know who I am. I'm following Jesus of Nazareth. And most of you have done that. That's a point of understanding your position and who you are. You can't stay there. And Jesus didn't stay there. The Bible tells us here that he was... I mean, he was led by the Spirit to go out into the desert from a time of testing by the devil. There's three characters in this story. Jesus, the Holy Spirit who leads him out to the desert, and the devil who spoke words to him. He is sent out in the desert for a time of preparation for ministry. Because from that point, so identification, time of testing, he's then going to go out and he's going to spend three years or so Doing ministry, doing all the stuff we read about, all the miracles and all the other stuff. So this is preparation time in the desert, testing time. I want you to imagine, and I want you to use your imagination, because your imagination is a powerful tool that God has given you to understand the stories of the Bible. You're not going to understand all of it. You know, go and do some more study, whatever. You're not going to understand all the culture and everything else. But you're, you're able to understand enough of the story to get it. I don't want you to imagine you're Jesus. That's ridiculous. But imagine you're in the desert like he was. And imagine you're experiencing the things that he experienced. It's hot. It's dirty. If you're blessed enough to have a beard, Jesus probably had a beard. You got dust and dirt all through your beard. And it's hard to breathe and, you know, you cough and dust comes out. It's sandy. It's hot. The sun's beating down upon you. There's not much shade. And it's dangerous. Maybe there's a snake. You know, there were snakes. There is snakes there. And there maybe a snake slithers past and it causes you to jump. There's scorpions and there's bugs and there's flies and you're hot. And have I mentioned that you're hungry? You haven't eaten for 40 days. You know that feeling in your stomach where I just need to eat something? You know, this, Jesus hadn't skipped breakfast. It's 40 days without anything to eat. So that is what's on his mind. Don't, he's human. How could he not? Well, the Bible tells us he's hungry. Sun goes down, the 38th day. And I don't know, you, you expect it to be a bit of relief. It's not relief. It's freezing cold. You've gone from stinking hot to freezing cold, and you're still dirty. You're still covered in grime. There's still insects and bugs, and maybe there's all this stuff that comes out in the night, and you want to lie down. You lie down on the rocks. There's no pillow. There's no swag. There's no rooftop tent on the top of your four-wheel drive. There's nothing. You've got no blanket. Your pillow is a rock. 
And you know, have you ever tried to go to sleep when you're really hungry? It's hard. All you can think about is food. And you know, the food, when, you, when your belly is full, you fall asleep. When, when you're hungry, you don't. So he wakes up in the morning, he slept terribly. He's feeling awful. And we think, oh, he's Jesus, he can cope. No, he was human as well as being God. And in his humanity, he's suffering. And then the devil comes along and he says something that the devil says a lot. He questions what it is that God has actually said. You know, back in Adam and Eve, back in Genesis, what did he say? Has God actually said this? This is what he says to Jesus. If you are the son of God, if you are, you know, you heard the voice, but did you really hear the voice? Was that actually really a thing? Like, he questions Jesus' actual identity. And that's what the devil does. Potentially, there's three voices in your head. Your head. There's your own thoughts, the thoughts of the Holy Spirit, and the thoughts of the devil. The devil is called, in the book of Revelation, old-fashioned term, he's called the accuser of the brethren. The accuser of the brethren. Brethren just means doors and sons. It means Christians. It means the gathering of the people. But the important word is the accuser. You know when you're feeling really I'm not saying it is a devil, but if you're feeling really lousy about yourself to an extreme, that's not from God. And that's probably not from you. He, he, his voice is one that's designed to make us feel awful about ourselves, to make us feel accused. And actually, his voice is actually there to make you feel doubt about your own faith, about God about how much God does love you, how much God wants for you, that's actually what he is trying to make you doubt. Has God said? He's trying to put it onto Jesus. And Jesus in this moment is probably feeling all of that. The devil would question your identity in God. Jesus actually needed to learn obedience through suffering. Have you ever thought about this? Jesus actually needs to learn to obey. What are you saying, Mark? What heresy are you speaking now? Like, I didn't say Jesus disobeyed. I think if you said Jesus was disobedient, that was wrong. I mean, Jesus is sinless. He never sinned. But he actually did. Hold on, everyone. He did need to learn to obey. And it's there in the, our next slide. Uh, Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8, the Bible tells us Jesus had to learn to obey. Don't just take my word for it, but test it yourself. This is actually what it says. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. He learned obedience from the things he suffered. I want to slow down for a moment. And I want you to think about your own experience. And I want you to think about perhaps a time where it's been a desert time for you. Have you ever had a time where it feels like God is not showing up? Where God is not doing the things that you expect him to do? God, you're loving you're amazing, you provide for me all the time, but you're actually in a season of desert. You're actually in a time where God actually, it feels like God isn't showing up at all. Where actually, where are you, God? I expected you to do this and you're not. You're not turning up. You know, it's actually in those times where God may very well be allowing you to go through even a sense of distance from him just to test, but more than that, to refine you, where you will learn obedience and trusting in God even when things aren't going so well. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego going into the fire. I love that phrase. We believe that God will save us from this, but even if he doesn't, we will still believe. It's really sad when, and we all know people that have 
gone away from God. Perhaps they've been Christians, we thought, and they've been part of a church and they've been excited, but they go through a time of testing, they go through a time of trial, and they say, well, God wasn't there, God didn't show up as I expected him to do, and they move away. That's, that's not good. No one wants that. But I want to speak to you about those times that you've been tested, where you haven't had an expectation of God which hasn't been met. What do you do with that? Here's the question this story poses. Up on the screen, we've got pictures of uh, bread over here on the far right and down here on the left, and then we've got the rocks of the desert. It, It would have been really easy for Jesus in the state that he was in to look down at those rocks and say, man, that looks like a beautiful loaf of bread. Their staple diet was bread. To look down at those rocks and say, they look like bread. I should turn those rocks into bread. I should do what the devil has said. Because here's the thing, right? Was there anything wrong with him doing that? Like, (laughs) my favorite miracle in the Bible is the first one. Does anyone know what the first miracle is in the Bible? Thank you. Water to wine. Well done, whoever that was. Is that you, Maddie? Water to wine. My favorite miracle. He turned water into wine. Here's the thing about that story. Water into wine. When does he do it? In a time of desert? No. He does it at a wedding. And not only does he do it at a wedding, he does it towards the end of the wedding. So the wedding has been going not for three or four hours like us lightweights, but back in the, those days, it was like three or four days of celebration. Right, So the people are well and truly, they've eaten, they've drunk, they've done everything. They're, they're, it's in a time of abundance. Oh, we've run out of wine. Poor you. And Jesus says, no, let's turn some water into wine. And he, he turns an enormous amount of water into wine. Here's the point. It's a time of abundance, and he does an, an abundant miracle. Another miracle is when he turns you know, the loaves and the fishes, 5,000 men, 15,000 people. What do they pick up at the end? 12 baskets. An abundance. Uh, an abundance of God's provision and miraculous stuff that happens. This is not a desert time. This is a time of abundance that he's done these two incredible miracles. And here's the thing. Was it wrong for him to do it? Obviously not. But here, in the desert, when he's really hungry and the devil comes and says, do this, he's like, no. No. Man lives by bread alone. And he won't do it in that season. I wonder if there was any sense of frustration in him or I wonder if in fact he was growing in that time and he needed to grow. The book of Deuteronomy, we have the story that Jesus quotes from. He quotes, man does not live by bread alone. He quotes it from this passage. And it's the story of the people of Israel. They have wandered through the desert for 40, something in that, 40 years And God has miraculously provided them bread from heaven, manna from heaven for that period of time. And now they're about to enter into the promised land. God wants them to remember a really important principle. Moses says to the people, Be careful to obey all the commands I'm giving you today. Then you will live and multiply, and you will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to give you ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for those 40 years. This is what he did it for. This is the reason. Humbling you, testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. There is a testing that you will go through in your Christian faith as you journey towards really ministering and ministering out of your deep faith. You will go through times of testing. You will go through times where it seems God's distant and where he's not showing up and where miracles don't seem to be happening, there are going to be times and moments like that. And that will stretch you. He humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. For all those 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out, your feet didn't blister or swell. Think about it. Just as a parent disciplines a child, the Lord your God disciplines you for your own good. So obey the commands of the Lord your God. 
by walking in his ways and by fearing him. You see, Satan wasn't merely suggesting that Jesus didn't satisfy his hunger. He was tempting Jesus to doubt the provision and purposes of his father, to supersede this season, to skip through it, to skip through the pain, to skip through the suffering, to just do the miracle straight away. No, Jesus was being tempted to skip all that. You can't skip those seasons. You can't skip those times. In fact, for some of you, it's actually something that you have to look forward to. I haven't been through some of that yet. Some of you are right in the middle of that season. And your faith and your trust in God is being tested. Will you believe? Will you trust in God even if the miracle doesn't come? What does it say? When you have a, when you have a baby, the baby doesn't ask deep questions. It just wants to be fed and it wants to be fed now. You know, you grow up and you start to fend for yourself. And as a parent, there's less and less you do. And the child starts to feed themselves and starts to be, be able to look after themselves a lot more. There's something similar in that process for us. Maturing in God. Understanding that our attention needs to go off our own needs. Become a minister and start thinking about the needs of others. And about what God wants us to do. I've got this little diagram that Bella's put together. These are the questions. This is the application. Where can you deny yourself in order to see someone else grow in their faith? Are you more interested in what you get out of church than what you put into it? I mean, the, the cliche is, uh, I went to church today and the worship wasn't that good. Mate, no one cares. We weren't worshipping you. We are worshipping the Lord your God. It's all we came to church to worship him. We weren't... We weren't we weren't putting on a show for you to be entertained. If you want to do that, go to Ticket Tech and, and buy a ticket to a concert. That's not what you're here for. You're here to look around, to be concerned for the others around you, and to be thinking about how it is, what does it mean to become all things for all people in order to win them to Christ, that verse that Paul tells us. What do, what do we need to do to win people to Christ as a church, as Q Baptist Church? Don't get me wrong. We want to be a church that throws out the invitation, that has services and everything else we do that are good. Of course we want that because we want to invite and we want to be invitational and we want people to be able to come and say and become part of our community that are, you know, just starting out in faith. And we want to be able to pour into them and give them good things. Of course we are. But let me speak to the heart of those that are moving beyond that. What does it mean for you to turn your attention from what it is you need to what it is that people around you need and what others need? What rights are you willing to give up in order to get closer to God and serve Christ and his church more effectively. Because 